I'm Peter Pitcher, Sheriff of Los Angeles County. As peace officers, our primary purpose is to protect life and property and to combat crime. In order to provide maximum professional service, we constantly encourage the development of new concepts and techniques, along with better and more efficient methods of operation. As an aid in accomplishing our objectives, this motion picture was produced by our department. It is a privilege and a pleasure to share it with you. What you are seeing here is a crime being committed. Two large juvenile delinquents have ambushed a doctor and are attacking him. The motive? To steal narcotics. Fortunately for this doctor, an alert police officer happens upon the scene while the crime is being committed. Notice that this police officer goes for his baton, not his gun, as he interrupts the criminal actions of these juvenile lawbreakers. Watch. The baton, properly used, has enabled this officer to survive an attack, to counterattack, and to disable his opponents temporarily without causing severe or permanent injury. The officer is firmly in control of the situation as he handcuffs the two youths together then searches them for concealed weapons. The regulation police baton, like a firearm, a uniform and a badge, often acts as a deterrent to violence and disorder. Sometimes, however, no symbol of law and order will act as a deterrent. And then, as this officer has ably demonstrated, the baton is a valuable law enforcement tool. Without having had to draw his gun, the officer remains firmly in command of the situation as he radios a two-man patrol car to take the youths into custody. Assistance is on the way, and until it arrives, the officer is firmly in command of the situation. Now that we have seen what a law enforcement officer, properly trained, can do with a baton, let's take a closer look at this important police tool. A baton is made of hard wood, smooth sanded and stained with natural wood colors. It is cylindrical in shape, 26 inches long and an inch and a quarter in diameter. Both ends must be rounded. The weight of the baton must not be less than 12, no more than 18 ounces. A baton may not be weighted or loaded in any manner. The grip of the baton consists of eight longitudinal grooves, each five and a half inches long a quarter of an inch wide and one-eighth of an inch deep. These grooves must be located an inch and a quarter from the grip end of the baton. A thong hole, three-sixteenths of an inch in diameter, must be located nine and a half inches from the grip end of the baton. A leather thong is threaded through this hole so as to form a loop thirty inches in circumference. The ends of the thong are threaded through the hole in opposite directions and secured by knots, as shown. To grasp the baton properly, place the thong loop over the thumb with the thong against the back of the hand. Rotate the hand to the thumb high position so that the baton is suspended by the leather thong. There should be about a quarter of an inch clearance between the hand and the end of the baton. If necessary, adjust the thong for proper clearance. With proper clearance, rotate the palm counterclockwise and grasp the baton firmly so that the butt end of the baton extends about an inch and a quarter beyond the edge of the hand. The thumb should be placed parallel to the longitudinal grooves. When held in this manner, the baton will not fly from an officer's hand in combat. 
Yet the officer may release the baton, if necessary, simply by relaxing his grip and straightening his fingers. If an officer has reason to expect trouble, he should assume the ready position. This is done by standing erect, feet about shoulder width apart, body weight distributed evenly on both feet. The tip end of the baton is placed in the left hand, palm up, and the baton is held firmly with both hands. The arms are now relaxed, allowing the baton to rest against the front of the legs. It is not good practice for an officer to raise and lower the tip end of his baton or to slap it in the palm of his hand. These motions have no real psychological value. The basic combat position for using the baton is the port arms position. An officer standing at the ready position moves easily into the port arms position by sliding his left foot forward, bending his knees slightly, and raising the baton up in front of his chest, angling the baton from the left shoulder down toward the right hip. The grip end of the baton, in the right hand, is held about at waist level. The right forearm is held parallel to the ground, with the right biceps close to the body. The tip end of the baton is held shoulder high in the left hand, palm up. The left forearm is held at an angle which places the baton six to eight inches out in front of the body. The officer's weight is evenly distributed on both feet. Both his hands grip the baton firmly with no more than an inch and a quarter of the baton extending beyond either hand. The port arms position allows ease of movement while engaging an opponent but makes it difficult for the baton to be wrestled from the officer's grasp. Here we see a move from the ready position into the port arms position and then up into the high port position, a variation of the port arms. The high port position is used to block overhead thrusts or blows from an opponent. A variation of the high port position is seen here. Held parallel to the ground at throat level, the baton provides an officer with leverage to help force a crowd back. Here we have a third attack position, the on guard, a position somewhat similar to a fencer stance. The body is turned toward the left, and the right foot is moved forward about 12 inches, pointing toward the opponent. The left foot is placed perpendicular to the right, and the right knee is bent slightly for good balance. The baton is held in the right hand in the regulation manner. The right biceps held close to the body, and the right forearm parallel to the ground. The baton is held at an angle pointing toward the opponent's throat. There are three basic methods of attack with a baton, and of course variations and combinations of these three. The first is the chop or cut, delivered either from the port arms position or the on guard position. Notice that from either position the officer puts his weight behind the blow, stepping forward in the direction of his opponent and striking a short chopping blow. Notice, too, that after the blow, the officer steps back quickly to his original attack position. He does not telegraph any of his movements. The second basic method of attack is the jab, usually delivered from the port arms position. In using the jab, the officer makes certain his body weight is behind the blow and that the tip of the baton strikes a vital area on his opponent's body. After each jab, the officer quickly recovers to the port arms position. The third basic method of attack is the thrust, a very effective technique for close infighting. Starting from the port arms position, the officer places the tip end of his baton in his opponent's solar plexus or under his ribs. Then by moving his body forward, the officer applies pressure to his opponent by forcing the baton forward and upward. If necessary, an officer can move the tip end of the baton up and down in a grinding motion over his opponent's ribs. There are many combinations of these three basic methods of attack, and like combination punches in boxing, they can be extremely effective. But before we consider additional baton techniques, it is best that we become thoroughly familiar with the various impact points of the human body. On these charts are shown some of the most vulnerable areas of the human body, areas in which a well-directed blow will render an opponent temporarily helpless. The baton is a weapon designed to attack, scientifically, the impact points of the human body shown on these charts. The baton should be directed against the side of the neck, the clavicle or collarbone, the shoulder tip, 
the outer biceps, the inner elbow, the ribs, the solar plexus, the forearm, the hand, the groin, the thigh, the kneecap, the calf, the instep, the toes, and the shin, against the scapula or shoulder blade, the kidney, the elbow tip or crazy bone, the knee, the calf, the ankle bone, and the tendon above the heel. A well-delivered blow to any of the points shown on these charts is usually sufficient to disable, temporarily, the average man. Sometimes, against extremely large and powerful individuals, two or more blows may be required to definitely render an opponent helpless. Let us see now just how a baton is used to attack the impact points shown on these charts. Here we see chops to the neck, to the collarbone, to the shoulder tip, to the outer biceps, to the inner elbow, a jab to the ribs, a jab to the groin, chops to the thigh, to the kneecap, to the calf, to the instep, to the toes, and to the shin. Oh, um, what happened, Sergeant? Oh, um, well, let's look at some of these combination techniques, shall we? Here we see a chop to the calf, a jab to the stomach, and a <laughs> chop to the chest. Now a jab to the stomach, a butt stroke to the ribs, and a jab to the ribs. And here a chop to the arm, a butt stroke to the ribs, and a chop to the calf. Looks pretty convincing, doesn't it? In addition to the basic baton techniques which we have seen demonstrated so far, there are other techniques which law enforcement officers find extremely useful. One of these is the drunk come along. Notice that the baton hand is held palm up to prevent losing the baton. Here we have the one arm come along, which provides easy control over the movements of a suspect. This one is the one arm takedown. Here it is again, this time in slow motion. A very useful technique when dealing with a belligerent suspect. Now we see the baton hammerlock. Again, the baton hammerlock in slow motion. This technique is especially useful for handling an intoxicated person or for removing an agitator from a mob. Notice that the officer's right hand and left arm are both tight against his opponent's neck to keep the suspect from turning. Note too that the officer ends up by taking a step back pulling his opponent off balance. This prevents a suspect from throwing the officer over his head, no matter how careful an officer may be. At some time, he will find that a suspect has been able to grab his baton. When that happens, the officer must be able to release it quickly and surely. One technique for doing this is the baton jerk release, seen here. Let's watch that again, this time in slow motion. The follow-up jab discourages the suspect from grabbing the baton again. Another technique for releasing a baton is the jab release, seen now. The slow motion camera shows how the officer raises the tip end of the baton, then forces it down between his opponent's arms. As before, a follow-up attack discourages further grabbing. A third technique for releasing a baton from an opponent's grasp is the wrist release. See how the officer combines quick movement with leverage to free his baton and then follows through with a sharp attack. Here is another release technique, the baton stomach throw. If, because of the suspect's superior size and strength, other release techniques prove ineffective, the baton stomach throw will force the suspect to release his grip on the baton. The baton is an excellent defensive weapon against kicks and blows. Here, an officer parries a kick to the groin. Notice how the officer bends forward from the waist, arms straight, elbows locked keeping the baton slightly below the groin. Here, the officer blocks a crushing overhead blow aimed at his head. The baton is held parallel to the ground. The officer's arms are straight, his elbows locked, his weight evenly distributed on both feet. Now we see a series of one-arm baton parries, 
demonstrating how a blow from any direction can be effectively blocked. Watch now as the officer and his assistant go at this in dead earnest. A baton against a knife? Easy. Watch this. When parrying an overhead knife attack, the officer blocks the suspect's arm, not the knife. Then he follows through with a baton attack. If the knife attack comes at waist level, instead of from overhead, the baton is just as effective. As before, the officer parries the arm of the suspect, then follows through with a baton attack. Well, now that we know something about the baton, let's look back at the deputy who had to defend himself against the two juvenile lawbreakers. The deputy saw trouble coming and raised his baton to the port arms position. The two youths spread out, then both jumped him at the same time. One went for the deputy's gun, while the other grabbed onto his baton and tried to wrestle it from his grasp. The deputy, by proper use of his baton, successfully handled a civil disturbance which involved defending himself and the doctor against two large juvenile lawbreakers. When an officer becomes involved in a physical disturbance, the few simple rules and techniques we have learned here for the baton will, after much practice, enable him to survive an attack, to counterattack, and to gain the advantage without endangering his own life or seriously injuring his opponents. Remember these facts about the baton. One, it is not a club. It is a weapon designed to deliver blows scientifically to the most vulnerable parts of the human body. Two, proper use of the baton requires knowledge, courage, strength, good footwork, and practice. Three, the baton, when carried in a military manner, is a symbol of law and order. It usually acts as a deterrent to violence. Four, if trouble does come, the baton is a valuable law enforcement tool for close-in fighting, as well as for handling an opponent at normal combat distance. The police officer who knows how to use his baton with propriety can perform his duties with an extra measure of confidence, secure in the knowledge that he has an advantage over every lawbreaker, not only in pressing an attack, but in effective defense and counterattack as well.